Hello. Hello. Are you trying different hellos now? The last time was very like, hello? hello, like just different hellos. I don't know. I'm trying out different ones. I thought you said, are you trying to run hellos? I was like, but it's my case. I always say hello first when it's no, my it's case. said, are you trying out different ones? <laughs> yes. That's, yeah. um, hello, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> you remember when I did that one? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I am your dad. <laughs> That's from Grace. My name's Kenna. I'm Kowal. And welcome back to another episode of Diagnosing a Killer. I think this is like our 45th episode. Is it really? I think. It's Basic either episode? 44th or 45th. Not including mental breakdowns. Yeah, but like the actual cases. Mm. Ooh, and not including Albert Fish. And not including Fish. <sighs> Dang, we've been doing this for quite a while. I feel mm-hmm. like we're kind of getting... I mean, we've got, we got into the groove a long time ago, but yeah. I feel like now it's like we have a bunch of bulk... Now we're getting a lot of traction because people see our page and it's not like, oh, they have five episodes. It's like, yeah. oh, they have a bunch. Like, I, I could at least binge this for a little mm-hmm. while until they, you know, get caught up and then we make some new ones. And right. For those of you that are new listening here, we do two episodes per week. We do one mental breakdown on Mondays and then we do a regular case on Thursdays. If you join our tier two and three memberships on Patreon... You will have access to a third additional bonus episode just for you on the 29th of each month. So Mm -hmm. that just came out, and that was Albert Fish. Yes. And those are a little bit more graphic. We try to do not so super gore on the podcast. Of course, it's Mm -hmm. true crime, so it's never going to (laughs) be PG. Right. But not super intense, because I'll tell you what, Albert Fish made me nosh as fuck. Yeah, it was a little nauseating. But yeah. Well, thank you guys for joining us (laughs) for another episode. I'm really excited (laughs) about this one. I feel like I say that every time, though. But before we get started, you want to shout out our... Stuff? Sure. Check out DiagnosingAKiller.com. There you can find links to merch, resources, and more. Hit us up uh, on any other social media platform at DiagnosingAKiller, other than Twitter, which is at KillerDiagnosis. Email us, rate us, listen to us, buy our merch. Live, laugh, love. Live, laugh, love. DAK. Yeah. I almost said BTK. <laughs> Live, laugh, lurk. (laughs) (laughs) Live, laugh, lurk. That's funny. (laughs) I like that. Yeah. And then um, just a reminder to people that are, again, new, not a reminder, I guess an announcement, we are going to be hosts at the True Crime Paranormal Podcast Festival in Austin, Texas in August. So get your tickets. You could access the discount code on our website. (laughs) Coel's drinking coffee. (laughs) You can access the discount code on our website. You get 15% off of that. And I think that's all we got, right? Yeah. All the discounts and all the cool stuff. Other than that, just check out Moviecation podcast. Check out Lady or Scaring Us podcast. We recently did collaborations with them. Yes. So, yeah. Okay, shall we do it? Yes, I'm excited. I think this is the quickest we've jumped into a case in a while. Give me the content warning. This is going to be a one. Content warning. This episode contains depictions of child abuse, bullying, and self-harm. If this episode is not for you, we encourage you to find one of our other ones. Remember, your mental health is very important, and we love you. Love you. Bye. Bye. Okay, shall we get into it? Yes. Okay. So today, we are going to be talking about not one, but two people. Oh. And their names are Richard Matt and David Sweat. It's literally spelled like sweat. Matt and sweat. Matt and sweat. Like sweaty Matt. Like S W E A T. <laughs> yeah. That's sweat, right? Yeah. Well, they were calling him sweat because <laughs> sweaty, sweaty Teddy. Do they sound familiar? <laughs> sweaty Teddy. <laughs> Not Teddy Teddy, but sweaty Teddy. Yeah. I mean, he was probably quite sweaty. He was, yeah, he was probably both. Anyway, that's not this topic today. Okay. We are talking about Richard Matt and David Sweat. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Matt. No, wait. Richard David. Richard Matt. And David Sweat. Richard and David. Okay. Richard, Matt, David. Sweat. <laughs> John. Okay. Sweat. <laughs> so we are going to be talking about Richard first. Okay. So we're just going to focus on him for a second. Okay. Do I know this? I don't know if I know this. You might know it. It's going to come full circle later on. So you might. <gasps> oh, is it? Okay. No, never mind. Go ahead. <laughs> it's, I would not be surprised if you knew it. Okay. <laughs> Richard William Matt was born on June 25th, 1966 in Ronawanda, New York, or Ronawanda. 
He was the youngest of two boys, his older brother being Robert Matt, which is so funny. He's like Dos Nombres. Actually, Robert Matt and Ri- Richard Matt. Richard Matt is Trace Nombres because his name is Richard William Matt. He has three <laughs> first names. <laughs> Tres Nombres. When Richard was just an infant, he was reportedly left in a hot car mm. for a significant amount of time. But this is from one source. It's not widely reported. However, kind of seems like it might be true. I was watching videos like that yesterday about, like, people rescuing babies from hot cars. That's fucking <sighs> terrifying. It How do you do that? Out. That's so gross. This one woman was like, I left my baby in the back seat because she was sleeping and I didn't want to wake her up, but she left the car running. She's like, well, I didn't leave her in the heat. It's like, yeah, yeah. but anybody can just steal your baby. Steal your child. Yeah. Baby nap. Mom and dad's new car says, like, when you turn it off, it says, like, check rear items for, or rear seat for items or whatever. Yeah. Like, make sure you got everything. Like, yeah. that's fucking so lame that you have to put that to make people not forget <laughs> their fucking kids. Well, there's that one dad that left his kid in the car, swore that, like, he left, like, he didn't know. In the for, garage, like, 12 right? hours. No. Oh. He went to work. Oh. And then he came works. halfway, like, the whole point was, like, they were saying, how do you not know that you had a baby in the car? Because he went to his car halfway, like, during lunch halfway through his day, and then still went back inside and, like, worked. Okay, that was on purpose. I think so. <laughs> I'm just speculating. I don't even know the case. Oh, that's awful. So there's not much known about Richard's biological parents since both of the boys were put up in foster care early in life. Okay. But Richard's biological father, Robert, was known as having a significant criminal record. Hmm. It's already happening. So clearly his parents probably ma- weren't maybe the greatest if they were put into foster care exactly. and they left him in a hot car. Yeah, exactly. Great. Uh, so Richard's father, Robert, his brother's name is Robert, but his father's name is also Robert. So Robert <laughs> Sr. had been previously arrested for things including assault, burglary, criminal possession of stolen property, and issuing bad checks. Okay, maybe not the best parents. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, issuing bad checks, sure, but assault? <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> like, that's excusable. White collar crimes. <laughs> Stupid. Robert Matt is believed to be dead, his father, but there's no substantial record on him again, so we really don't know. But I'm sure he is by now. Probably. His kid was born in 66, 66. so he's probably dead. Richard and his brother were taken in by Vern Eden and his wife, who was not named. This is their foster parents. So they would actually enroll both of the boys in Little League. Like, like, so sweet. Like, okay, we're going to take you and make you... (laughs) Do you want babies? Is that what you're doing right now? You want your babies in Little League. Well, my babies are definitely going to be in Little League, for sure. My boys. (laughs) I just think it's sweet that they... Just immediately kind of got to try to get them socialized, like, put them in sports. Yeah. And, you know, clearly they're, like, they're not just, like, okay, you know, just deal we with have it. you, just deal with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So beginning life on a rough patch, it's no surprise that Richard was known for having behavioral issues throughout grade school, which included terrorizing children on the school bus. Oh. It reminds me of when your son got, not bullied, but, like, talked to a certain way on the school bus, and I was like, I just want to talk to him. Who is he? Yeah, <laughs> like, I just want to talk to him. What was the kid's name? No, I didn't even want to know. I didn't want to know the yeah. kid's name, because if I knew, it would yeah. be a problem. He lives in our neighborhood, so... Yeah, I know. <laughs> Where's his house? <laughs> so one of Richard's childhood friends, who chose to remain anonymous, stated about him at this time, quote, Funny kid. Always funny. Always had a big smile on his face. But, you know, just couldn't stay out of trouble. He tried to beat me up at the playground. That's the first time I ever met him. That was my first initiation with Rick Matt. He was this bully. Once I got into ninth grade and stuff, my father started helping him out and stuff. He came to live with my dad for a little while, and that wasn't the only time he tried to help him. He was always trying to help him, ever since he was 12 years old. Hmm. End quote. So this kid clearly knew him, like, throughout childhood. When Richard was in his early teens, he stole a houseboat and was sent to a group home after being caught. So early teens, I guess he maybe he chose that he didn't want to be in the foster home, or maybe the parents were like, okay... Clearly, like, we can't, we don't know how to handle his behavioral issues. Um, They want to send him to a group home. Sure, that might be the best route for him to go. This would not last long, however, and he would escape this group home by stealing a horse and riding it off into the sunset. (laughs) In the the 70s? Yeah. After escaping the group home, he hid from capture in Allegheny State Park, if I said that wrong. Sorry, New Yorkers. Although he seemed to love the thrill of life, his behavior was most definitely an act, and Richard was actually very depressed and Hmm. lost under the surface. This same childhood friend who remained anonymous had had a father who was close with Richard as a child, like I said, and he treated Richard as, like, a second son. Hmm. This father would later recall an event of Richard's childhood that scarred him. 
When Richard was just 15, he had been in and out of foster homes so many times that he had had enough. The father recalled his incident, quote, Rick opened the door. He was standing in the door with his hands down at his sides, facing his hands open, and he had a knife in one hand, and he had cut himself 30 to 40 times all over his wrists, arms. There was blood all over the place. Oh my God. End quote. God, it's so awful. It's like this kid that you see as like a son and you just go to like greet him one day and he's like, yeah, like bleeding. Everywhere. Hands out. Oh, that's so scary. I know. This boy's father would describe Richard as both Jekyll and Hyde, but in the end, he was more tempted by his destructive side. Richard's friend would later recall as well, quote, he told my father at one point he wanted to be a police officer, you know, when he was younger, 15 years old or whatever. But that side to him, it was almost like an addiction, hmm. referring to, like, his dark side. Yeah. Richard and his brothers seemed to be criminals from the very beginning, almost as if they were born into it. Hmm. On top of Richard's crimes, Robert had his own list of arrests from past crimes. He was arrested four times between 1985 and 1989 for burglary, larceny, and assault, although the two brothers were not known to have committed any crimes together. Hmm. So they just became just like their father. Yeah. Or at least Richard's father. I'm not sure if they have the same dad. Richard was seen as a low-grade criminal that was usually involved in burglaries and thefts, and he got really into drugs during this time as well, quickly developing a reputation for violence. He would be arrested eight different times in the late 1980s and early 90s, and even gained a nickname with the police department, Ricky Matt. Ricky Matt. <laughs> Ricky Matt. Come on, Ricky Matt. Yeah. <laughs> Ricky Bobby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> He was taken into custody for one or more of these crimes and was serving time. However, he was still battling with his alter ego of wanting to become part of law enforcement. And this, along with him probably getting a lesser sentence, gave way for Richard to become a criminal informant for several years oh. in the 1980s. Well, that seems like it would work out. Yeah. It's a little sure. bit of both, right? Mm -hmm. Tonawanda Police Captain Frederick Foley's, who was a patrolman when Richard first became known around town, said that Richard was just a small-time thug. He said, quote, one time he beat up a girl pretty bad. He got charged for assault in the second degree. That's a felony. But the things he was charged with later in life? Wow. Ooh. <laughs> Foreshadowing. <laughs> in June 1986, Richard climbed a fence in the Erie County Correctional Facility where he was being held for a one-year sentence for assault and escaped. Richard was able to evade police capture for four whole days but he made a mistake when he hopped on a freight train to his brother Robert's house in Tonawanda, where he was ultimately apprehended. I was going to say, you're going to, like, what do, you, what do you think the police are going to do? Immediately go They're to your gonna, family. Immediately <laughs> going to go to your family, yeah. you doink. So he was able to escape again this jail because he was serving some time. No, he's back in jail. <laughs> Even though he fucking escaped, Richard was somehow able to remain a criminal informant for the police. I guess they don't care as long as they're getting their guys, right? Like, yeah, I mean... Yeah, you escaped, keep giving us info, you know? If anything, it's a good story, because, you know what I mean? They're gonna be like, oh, did you spend any time in jail or prison? And be like, yeah, actually, I just got out, or whatever. Like, it's all real, I, I you know? I just escaped. <laughs> I just escaped. <laughs> in 1991, Richard became involved in a murder-for-hire scheme when he met fellow inmate David Testar. Is Richard blonde? No. Okay. Well, I don't know. He has like he had like really short hair in the photos I saw. Yeah. But it looked dark. Mm. David was a California native who was actually married to the granddaughter of a Warner Bros. founder. <gasps> oh. Right. And this isn't the same David from earlier. This is a different David. A different David. Oh, there's David always so many Davids. I know. <laughs> what was that one we were listening to where the guy had like two Davids? That yeah, he, it was like, Catherine. Married. It was David, David, and John John. Oh, it was Catherine. I'm yeah. thinking for some reason it was a male. Yeah, it was David, David, and John, John. David, David, and John, and John. Yeah. <laughs> but somebody, no, who else had, it was a, it was a man. That was in a relationship with a David. Oh, the Patrick Kearney? Was David yeah, David I think Hills? it was Kearney, yeah. yeah. So David, this guy, had found himself in jail after allegations that he embezzled $1.6 million from his wife. Wow. Again, she's the granddaughter of Warner Bros. So, wealthy. And in the 70s? 80s. 80s this this is in the, probably in the early 90s. Oh, early 90s, yeah. my bad. Richard and David would become, quote, friends while in prison... And Richard was able to convince David to put up Richard's $15,000 bail. He was like, put up my bail? Yeah, he, Richard told David, hey, put up my bail for me so I can go take care of business for you on the outside. Okay. This would have been thirty-three grand today. David agreed to pay Richard's bail with the agreement that once Richard was a free man, 
he would kill David's wife, <gasps> ultimately ruining his upcoming trial about his embezzlement. So he's like, if my wife's dead, then there's no then one there's to no... finger me for the crime and yeah. I can get out of jail. I hear people do that, though. Or they try to, at least. Yeah. Isn't this super interesting, though, that I just did a contract oh, yeah. killing and then it came up? Also, just to put the timeline into perspective, Richard is only 25 years old at this time. LOL. He's asking a fucking 25-year-old to go and become a master yeah, assassin. The novice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, he's what? the novice. <laughs> Along with killing David's wife, Richard was also asked to kill a former business partner of the Telstars. So I guess another person that could finger him for the crime. What are the Telstars? That's his. That's David's last name. Oh, Telstar. oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. okay. So David paid Richard's bail, and Richard was released for the time being on charges of rape and assault. So again, he's not like... I'm sure this is clear, but he's not like not going to get tried. He's just out until he waits for his hearing. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a bond. Yeah. Instead of following through with his promises to kill David's wife and old business partner, of course. Richard immediately went to authorities to turn David in for <gasps> trying to hire him. <laughs> Dang, that's savage. Well, he's an informant. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> you know I mean? Yeah. Well, and he could use the time off, too. Yeah, I mean, exactly. You know, like <laughs> Richard told authorities that David, quote, told him where to find the intended victims and what to do with their bodies. <gasps> He also stated that David's instructions, quote, were to burn Desiree's body so that no one could identify it. Oh, that's so that's fucked up. That's his wife, obviously. Yeah, right? So no one can identify it? Like, I guess my wife just disappeared. I guess she really doesn't want to make these alle- allegations against me. I guess yeah, she I guess wanna, she's, yeah. <laughs> she, she just probably went into hiding because she's yeah. so scared of me. Richard expressed his concerns to police that he thought that there may be a, quote, backup killer, like, in case he bailed. Yeah. So, police issued him a bulletproof vest, just in case. <laughs> it's like, dumb and dumber. What if they shot me in the head? What if they shot me in the head? Well, that was a risk we were willing to take. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but they're like, yeah, here, just thanks for your cooperation. Here's a bulletproof fucking vest, yeah. just in case you got got. Just for fun. Got. Yeah. It's nice to play dress up. So, like you said, Richard probably thought that he would be receiving a lesser sentence for giving this information to police. Right. But they didn't alter his sentence at all. They were just like, thanks for the info. <laughs> Get fucked. Jog on. Yeah. Here's a bulletproof bulletproof vest for your troubles. Yeah. We're in prison. <laughs> <laughs> David Telstar would later plead guilty to promising Richard Matt an additional $100,000 after completing the killings. Whoa. David was sentenced to five years in prison for this. Five years. Cute. Just Cute. five years. Yep. At some point while he was awaiting trial, Richard would meet a woman by the name of V. Harris, and the two would quickly have a child together. Oh, <laughs> never know with the. With I these. know. Never know. <laughs> so she would quickly become pregnant with his child. Although he would not see his child for a while after he was born, V. would give birth to their son Nicholas in 1992. Hmm. Is it V. E. E.? Yes. Okay. Nicholas would later say about his father, quote, my father broke into my mother's house in Tonawanda and beat her. Hmm. I was an infant when it happened. Everybody is born innocent, but he was raised around crime. Then he went into foster care. And wow. Quote. So Nicholas essentially grew up knowing that his father was a bad guy. Yeah. Richard would be released from prison in the late 1990s and was out and about up to his usual antics very shortly after. <laughs> I know. On December 3rd, 1997... Richard Matt and another man by the name of Lee Bates would kidnap Richard's 76-year-old former boss, William Rickerson, from his North Tonawanda home. What the fuck? After attacking and subduing him, Richard forced William into the trunk of Lee's car. The reason that he wanted to kidnap his boss is because Richard believed that William had access to a large amount of money, and they wanted to, like torture him to, like, steal it from him, essentially. Mm -hmm. Get bank information or find out where most of this money is. Yeah. The two, along with William in the trunk, would drive for nearly 27 hours and periodically would stop to beat William, trying to get information out of him. That's so fucked up. He's an old man. I know. After over a day of this, Richard became impatient, not hearing anything about this stash of money that didn't even fucking exist, by the way. What? So he just thought he, just he did. Ha- thought that he was rich. Richard became impatient, and unfortunately, he would break William's neck with his bare hands, killing him. Do you think he meant to do that? I'm not sure if he meant to kill him. I think he meant... I mean, he meant to strangle him, obviously. Yeah. But I don't know if he... Because I got, like, two different accounts. It was, like, 
he was he knew he wasn't going to get any information out of him, but he couldn't let him go, so he killed him. Or he was trying to get information and accidentally killed him. But yeah. either way, he was probably going to fucking kill him, yeah. honestly. Okay. I guess that was, like, a, yeah, essentially what I was asking is, like, if he meant to. Like, did he go in with the intention of knowing he was going to kill him? Honestly, he's the only one that, know- that knows that. Yeah. Richard then dismembered William's body with a hacksaw and disposed of the parts into the Niagara River. Jesus. <sighs> I know. Richard would then flee to New York State to avoid capture. After hearing of this crime, and later on realizing it was Richard Matt that committed it, Lieutenant on the North Tonawanda Niagara County Force in 1997, Randy Zucala was interviewed. Randy and Richard actually grew up down the street from each other, and Richard was no stranger to Randy when he found out about this crime. Randy grew up in North Tonawanda, and Richard, as we know, was born in Tonawanda. These two cities are commonly referred to as the Twin Cities, as the Erie Canal is the only thing that separates them. Oh, okay. So they're two different places. I had to, like, really look at It's like <laughs> Virginia like, oh. and West Virginia. Yeah, but essentially, cities. but it's cities. <laughs> <laughs> so even though the two were in different cities, they were very close in age, and Richard had a reputation growing up that Randy quickly noticed. And again, Randy's the Friend. future lieutenant. Oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. He's the future lieutenant of North Tonawanda. I see. I kind of, like, said that quickly earlier. Sorry. <laughs> Just to be clear. No, it's okay. I thought the sergeant was talking about randy to no, no, no richard the sergeant is randy is randy <laughs> yes <laughs> he's the same guy he's the same guy he's is he the name. sergeant <laughs> randy would later say about richard quote he would terrorize kids on the school bus friends of mine knew him he would just terrorize people even in elementary junior high he had issues end quote hmm. so back to the crime we had just talked about richard had just murdered his former boss and dumped his body into the river and fled to new york state Richard would leave this crime with a wedding ring, some credit cards, and less than $100 in cash. Totally worth somebody's life. Totally worth it, especially when he was, like, expecting this giant payout. Um, Maybe you should, like, get your fucking facts straight and realize that this man has no money. For sure. Not no money, but you know what I mean? Like, he probably didn't have nearly as much as he thought he did. The same month, in December of 1997, a fisherman made a grisly discovery when he came across William Rickerson's body washed up on shore. Mm. Randy Sukala was on the case. He stated about the discovery, quote, It was kind of a strange one. It was a missing person at first. Then we looked through the house, found some evidence. There was blood in the house, but no body. Hmm. End quote. Shortly after this discovery, Richard would flee to Texas, where he would then cross the Rio Grande into Matamoros in Mexico. Less than two months after Richard murdered William, he found himself in trouble yet again. Hmm. On February 20th, 1998, Richard was in a bar at the same time as fellow American Charles Arnold Peralt. Again, this is in Mexico. Okay. Charles was an engineer that had been employed at Rancho de Mexico, a local factory. That was my hands <laughs> love. That was my best. But you could do it though. <laughs> but you could totally do it. I know. I did. I did the hand. You See, did with, the hand with the Spanish. I do the hand, but with the Italian, I do the hand. The, the hand. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like. Yeah. Essentially, you're doing, like, an okay, like, yeah. an okay ole. Ro. Ro. So, anyway, yeah, we, we're both fucking Spanish, and I still get, like, uncomfy doing my Spanish accent. You don't need to be uncomfy. <laughs> At one point in the night, Charles headed to the restroom, where Richard followed him and began stabbing him in the back and abdomen, attempting to rob him of $300. Because, again, that's worth someone's life. That's definitely what I want to do. Like, okay, as I'm being stabbed, my first thought is to hand over the cash give you three hundred dollars yeah. <laughs> just without even being threatened yeah just yeah not like hey give me all the money in your pocket just you're actively being stabbed and yeah. the first thing that you're thinking of doing is going through your pockets <laughs> here's no the money. here's the money gosh unfortunately charles would be stabbed a total of nine times and he would not survive oh my attack. god this is at a bar in mexico yeah my next sentence is after this public ass murder <laughs> public ass murder <laughs> richard tried to flee the scene of the crime but was quickly apprehended by police when questioned by officers, Richard told them that his name was Wayne M. Schimpf, who was actually the name of his half-brother. What a oh. dick. Oh, God, that's fucking Angel Rosendas. <laughs> yeah. It's my, it's my uncle. It's I'm, my uncle. I'm my uncle. I am my own uncle. <laughs> I am my own uncle. <laughs> Richard would be convicted of this murder and given a prison sentence of 23 years in a fucking Mexican prison. Well. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome, though. I mean, like, fuck. Like, well, you fucked up here. Now yeah. you're going to stay here. <laughs> Don't fuck up in Mexico, y'all. That's the moral. While imprisoned in Mexico, Richard was nearly able to escape by climbing to the roof before being shot by guards. 
Because oh, oh. <laughs> they don't fuck around. They don't. His son would later say about this attempted escape, quote, he's been shot like nine times. It's like they can't kill him. He's like 50 cent. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> can't keep him down. While Richard was in jail in Mexico, American authorities were working tire... Authorities? American authorities? authorities? I don't know why that sounds weird. I want to say authorities. <laughs> authorities. <laughs> I told many, many authorities. <laughs> I heard in the Hitman episode, I said something that we just spoke about. I said spoke about and you didn't... <laughs> Correct me. <laughs> Just to let everyone know. I'm sorry. I know how to speak. <laughs> I spoke spoke about. about. I said spoke about. I was like <laughs> cringing in my car. Ugh. I was like, oh my god. Well, sometimes, we, and we've said it before on the podcast, like with the headsets on and then like just listening through the microphone and everything sometimes you don't catch it until you listen back and you're talking like, said, so much and so fast like yeah. it doesn't even register like i was saying inner communications for speech and it's interpersonal communications <laughs> and i'm an idiot that said inner inner communications like I'm what does that mean here, fucking... i'm over here talking to myself yeah. inner communications <laughs> <laughs> i'm over here air four base air <laughs> Air Force Base. Air, Air Force Base. I also remember a long time ago when we like first started doing the mental breakdowns, you said anti-personality was sort of like eight times instead of anti-social. Oh, anti-social. <laughs> yeah. Do I don't know why. Anti My brain just abbreviates things like that. It's the opposite of a personality disorder. <laughs> anyway, Air authorities, Force authorities. American, American authorities were working tirelessly to get to the bottom of the discovery of the body in 97. Mm -hmm. Okay. Evidence was able to lead police to Lee Bates, who would be tried with the murder of William Rickerson. Hmm. In order to receive a plea deal, Lee did give up Richard Matt's name as his accomplice and the one who ultimately killed William. Yeah. Lee Bates was sentenced to 15 years for his role in the crime. How can he prove that, that Matt did it, though? I'm not sure. Because, yeah, Ricky Matt did it because it... You know, it's just hearsay at that point. It's yeah, like, but they also have his DNA, oh, so they there. might have found additional DNA at the crime, yeah. and he was like, they may be able to match it to him because he's been in the database before, yeah. you know? Hmm. I'm not sure. But after Lee's testimony and gruesome evidence, police had enough to charge Richard Matt with second-degree murder. He also stabbed a motherfucker to death in a bar, so it's not atypical. But they don't know that because he's in Mexico. Oh, I see. So this is this happening is while work. he's in Mexico, and mm -hmm. he's in prison in Mexico. Mm -hmm. I see. Also, just for the listeners, if anybody is not sure what the difference is between first and second degree murder, because everyone didn't know that at one point, first degree is when it's planned, second degree is when it's not. And the reason they want to charge him with second is because we think it might have been an accidental killing, or he decided after the fact to kill him rather than just kidnap him. William. Yes. Okay. Well, so so they don't know he's in prison in Mexico. No. Okay, they don't know so where he is at so all. So they're actively, they're going to be looking for him at this point. Yes. Because Lee's in prison for it. Yes. Okay. So I was going to say the only catch was they had no clue where Richard was. Mm -hmm. Throughout the next several years, Richard remained in prison in Mexico while American authorities were scratching their head trying to figure out where the fuck this guy was. Yeah. <laughs> in 2007, so like 10 years later, mm -hmm. Mexican authorities contacted American authorities to say that they were going to extradite a drug cartel kingpin that was giving them so much trouble in prison, they didn't want to take care of him any longer. Oh, wow. And they knew he was American, so like, fuck you, like, you're going back to America oh. because mm. we don't want you. Yeah. Reporter Rick Pfeiffer stated about this sudden transfer, quote, he was being flown back to Texas, and the second this guy gets off the plane, it took federal marshals almost a day to figure out who the guy was. It was Richard Matt. Ugh. A drug cartel kingpin? kingpin. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what the what? fuck happened? <laughs> so <laughs> within, within the last 10 years, years in jail, he's become a fucking kingpin for the cartel? <laughs> he just owns the cartel. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> From prison. Quote, this is still the reporter. There had been no discussion with the American government about extradition. He had just been such a difficult prisoner. If you can imagine a guy who seemed too difficult to stay in a Mexican prison. Seriously. I was yeah. just about to say that. <sighs> Wild. One of Richard's ex-girlfriends, Joanna Capretto, testified against him. She stated that Richard casually smoked a cigarette as he confessed to breaking his former boss's neck. She also said that he stated that it was an accident. Hmm. She also said about Richard, quote, Ricky would dominate. Like, what the fuck does that mean? What does that mean? Adding that Lee Bates, quote, was pretty much a follower. He just dominates. He just dominates. He's out here just dominating. <laughs> 
It was also noted that lawmen who worked with Richard and against him during his trial noticed his inherent ways of manipulation with, and charm with women. Hmm. Detective David Bentley testified against Richard and stated, <laughs> another David, quote, when he's cleaned up, he's very handsome and, in all frankness, very well endowed. He gets girlfriends any places he goes. Ew. I'm like, how do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> I saw it once. He testified against him, and he's like, he got a big dick. <laughs> you know, that's why his nickname's Dick. Not, not because it's a nickname for Richard or anything. <sighs> Sorry, I have to say that. <laughs> he's testifying against him, and he still says he has a big dick. He's like, yo, shout out. How you do it, bro? How you do it? <sighs> that's funny. <laughs> testifying. He's like, yo, like, this guy's definitely guilty, but like, but also, you like, know, he got a pack. He got it. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Richard's public defender, Matthew Penn, also testified in court, quote, I can't explain it. I can see him as a guy who would have a lot of friends. Rick Matt was a fun but dangerous guy to hang out with. Rick Matt. It still gets Rick me. Matt. Rick Matt. Rick Matt. Rick Matt. Rick Dick Matt. <laughs> Rick Dick Matt. Rick Big Dick Matt. <laughs> With Lee Bates' damning testimony 10 years prior, along with all the other testimonies from various people, Judge Sarah Sheldon had more than enough reason to charge Richard with the maximum sentence for second-degree murder, with no chance of parole until 2032. So this is of William, the murder of William? Yes. Okay. Sarah Sheldon, the judge, was noted as saying that this decision was, quote, frankly, not a difficult decision. Yeah. Obviously. It was a career criminal. Yeah. His whole life. In March of 2008, Richard was sent to Niagara County Jail, but during his trial, authorities suspected that he had planned that he had a plan to escape from the jail, and he was made to wear a stun belt, and snipers were posted outside of the courtroom to prevent his escape. Should like, have brought your going anywhere, motherfucker. Should have brought your vest, your bulletproof vest, <laughs> as long as it'll shoot you in the head. Shortly after, in June of 2008, he was transferred to Clinton Correctional Facility in Danamora, Clinton County. After hearing of this shocking break in the William Rickerson case, Randy Suzcala was noted as saying about Richard, quote, Looking at his mugshot in the paper, he's just got the look. He's looking through the camera. It's like looking at a photo of Charles Manson. Same thing? Probably. Ew. Uh, disgusting. <laughs> I love the quotes, though. They're so, like, Me intense, too. right? Okay. We're going to change gears a little bit here. And now that Richard is in prison, we're going to talk about... David Sweat. Sweaty. Sweaty Betty. Sweaty Betty. <laughs> Sweaty Teddy. Sweaty Petty Duddy. Petty Duddy Duddy Betty Duddy. Now, just to let everyone know, there's significantly less known about David's childhood than Richard's. So. Okay. David Paul Sweat. Oh, he was almost Trace Nombres, too. <laughs> David Paul Sweat was born on June 14th, 1980, to Pamela Sweat. His mother was raising David along with two sisters when he was born, so his father was not known. He wasn't mm -hmm. around when he was born. David was born and raised in the Binghamton metropolitan area. By all accounts, David had a troubled childhood that was littered with violent tendencies. Just like Rickard. Rickard. <laughs> Richard. <laughs> just like, like oh. Ricky. <laughs> Ricky. His mother, Pamela, would later admit, quote, He really wasn't raised into the best society. We drank a lot. We partied a lot. His life was into turmoil. Oh, that's his mother saying that. Yeah. Fuck. And his father wasn't around, but she did have, like, a boyfriend that would come around and yeah. they would get really drunk all the time. At nine years old, David was sent to live with his uncle in Florida when he became too much for his mom to handle. He had thrown knives at his mother and also thrown a rocking chair on another occasion. One of his sisters, Tilly, said of Pamela, quote, She had two nervous breakdowns because of him when he was little and she can't take any more. Well, I think, I don't know, I think I'd be pretty, like, desensitized or pissed if your mom was, like, constantly wasted all the time. Like, yeah, and that was even her admitted. saying that. Yeah. If she's willing to admit that, it's probably worse than what she's saying it is, yeah, you know? Yeah, for sure. Like, you know, when you go to the doctor and they're like, how often do you drink? And you're like, three times a week, and they're like, okay, seven times a week. Like, yeah. <laughs> they know that, like, you're not going to tell them. How many, yeah, or, like, when an officer pulls you over, and you're like, how many have you had to drink tonight? Two. Okay, four. You're stumbling. <laughs> Double <Okay>. it. <laughs> Double it and give it to the next person. <laughs> Tilly also stated that David had a dual personality. Quote, he could be a nice boy, but when the little bit of Hellion in him came out, it came out full force. Jeez. I little know. Hellion. I know. But full force? Come on. 
Pamela's boyfriend, while David was young, stated about David that he would burn his toy cars or smash them with rocks and hammers. What the fuck? Yeah. I'd be so pissed. It's like, bitch, you know how much that was? I know. $15 fucking car. You think fucking toy cars grow on trees? No. No. They get made in the factory. Yeah. Because they're plastic. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't know why I said that. (laughs) (laughs) They're not made of wood. They're not. (laughs) Duh. Duh. (laughs) Tilly also... (laughs) So stupid. Tilly also added, quote, he was rude to anyone and everyone when the mood hit him. Like, it's like he could snap on on a dime. Nah. While living with his aunt and uncle, David stole and wrecked his aunt's car and was soon after sent into foster care. Sound familiar? Yep. (laughs) By the time they were in their late teens, David and his cousin Jeffrey A. Nabinger Jr. were spending most of their nights on the streets. The two had trouble holding down jobs and were frequently selling weed to make some fast cash. Weed. (laughs) Merehwin. David was known as elaborately planning burglaries, and him, along with Jeffrey, were both arrested several times in the late 90s and sent to prison. Sounds like Richard Ramirez, kind of, when he would run around the streets all the time. Yeah. Although they were peep-tomming, so... Peep-tomming. Tom Peeping, I think it was. Tom Peeping. Tom, wait. Peep-tomming. Yeah, peep-tomming is better. <laughs> I was like, wait. I had to, like, really think of it. In 1996, David and Jeffrey tried to steal computers and cash from a Br- Bingham and Group home where he was living. Their plan was to wear balaclavas, ski masks, and lock a woman in a storage room. And part of this plan was stealing blueprints and the layout of a home. I guess they were going to, like, hit the home second. Yeah. The two were arrested for this after it was unsuccessful. During the hearing, parole parole board commissioner Vanessa Ann Clark said to David, quote, You had a big plan to go in there and tie up the lady who worked there and steal the stuff. Were you watching too much television or something, Mr. Sweat? (laughs) David replied, quote, Yes. Miss Clark, quote, why did you do that? David replied, quote, I was 16. I felt like it would make me look better to my friends if I did that. What kind of friends were you hanging out with? Says Mrs. Clark. David responds, David responds, troublemakers. Like, you're the fucking one. Like, <laughs> okay, haha. Like, yeah. Oh, you've been watching too much TV recently? He's like, I have a mental disorder. He's like, I live on the streets. (laughs) Bitch, this has not been easy, okay? (laughs) My mom is Do you think I own a TV? (laughs) Is that what you're saying? Like, fuck. No, why do you think I was trying to fucking steal one? (laughs) (laughs) The two, being David and Jeffrey, were sentenced to five years of intensive supervision probation for this crime. Okay. Because they didn't follow through with it, I guess. Mm. The Broome County Court Judge, Martin E. Smith, said about this, quote, The conduct in which he was engaging was like, what are you thinking? It was the dumbest stuff ever. When he sentenced the two, the judge referred to David and Jeffrey as, quote, teenage idiots. It's like, dude, way to fucking, like, make them feel worse. Like, like, maybe try to help them. Yeah. Maybe try to rehabilitate. You know, that's what the fucking prison system is supposed to be for. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. No, we all are just fucking idiots. They're just dumb dumb teenage stuff. Yeah, seriously. Teenagers Watching too much kids. TV. You playing too many video games. <laughs> you play Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> it's a real world. <laughs> this is a real world, boys. You can't be teenage e as you're gonna be right here. Idiot. Teenage dirtbag. <laughs> He's like, smells like tea <laughs> spirit. spirit in here. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Jesus. <laughs> Teenage scared the living <laughs> shit out of me. He's just playing like every song about teenagers. Okay. Ah. All right. Whether it's your favorite browser or by app, listening to audiobooks with Audiobooks Now makes it even easier and more affordable to enjoy your favorite books. Audiobooks Now offers up their club price plan, which includes 50% off your first purchase each month and additional offers after your first purchase. Click the link in the show notes below to receive two months free and just $4.99 for each additional month. Get audiobooks you love for less with Audiobooks Now. Start your free trial today. <laughs> that song probably wasn't even out yet, actually. No, it that wasn't. came in the early 2000s, right? Teen Spirit is hilarious. Yeah, that's funny. It smells though. like Teen Spirit in here. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> Curry smells like Teen Spirit. Curry smells like Teen Spirit. <laughs> okay. A year later, David was convicted of second degree burglary when he and Jeffrey tried to steal from his cousin's landlady. Like, 
Why do they keep... Okay, that... Okay, man, it's a little dumb to start, like, victimizing people that you actually fucking know. And, the, you know what I mean? They know yeah. you. Like, come on. Maybe not do that. Yeah. I mean, don't do it to strangers either. I'm not saying... <laughs> I'm saying yeah, it's okay the other way, but, like, come on. You're just kind of asking for it. So this would be the first time that David entered prison. Like, actual prison. Even though he was in prison, he was still scheming, and authorities actually found a list of future crimes in his cell. Oh my god. <laughs> he just had a pen and paper. Just, just a pen and paper. <laughs> jotted it down. Hey, do you think I could borrow out a pen and paper? Yeah, why? What's up? Nothing. My hit list. <laughs> just a list. Just a list Jesus. of names. In the early morning of July 4th, 2002... David, Jeffrey, and a third man by the name of Sean Duvall made a new burglary plan. So he's out now. Yeah. The three burglarized a fireworks store in Great Bend, Pennsylvania, to steal firearms and not fireworks. I'm not sure. I guess they had both, apparently. (laughs) They had guns? Yes. Unless it was a firearm store, and I misread it, but it said fireworks store to steal firearms. Either way, they stole guns. Let's well, just you know, say that. I wonder if it's because it's technically an explosive, because Jersey's that way, too. Yeah. That's what Stymax is saying, that fireworks are illegal in New Jersey because they are because they contain gunpowder. Oh, I don't know. So that. I'm wondering if it's not, like, a fireworks slash firearms store, it like might you said, be. because it's technically an explosive. Because they have the license. Yeah. It makes sense. Their robbery was a success, and the three traveled back to New York. Again, that happened in Pennsylvania. Oh, so that's even, yeah, it's yeah. close to Jersey anyways. So the three pulled into a parking lot where they began transferring the stolen firearms from one vehicle to another. I guess they were, like, moving it. I don't Mm. know. But while they were doing this, they were spotted by a Broome County Sheriff's deputy by the name of Kevin Tarsia. Kevin approached the men to question what they were doing, and without hesitation, David opened fire on the (gasps) officer before he could get close enough to speak to them. Kevin was hit multiple times, falling to the ground, but still alive. Oh, my God. David would then run Kevin over with his vehicle to try to kill him. After realizing that the officer was still alive after this... Fucking bad bitch alert. Jeffrey shot him two more times in the face, ultimately ending his life. Oh, God. God, I know. That's fucking awful. Like, that's a lot to experience in your last moments. I'm sorry. Like, he was shot a total of 15 times. Holy Which shit. means he was shot 13 times and then run over and was still alive. Wow. And then shot twice more to kill him. Oh, that poor man. God, I know. And how old is is uh, David at this point? He's like... He would be 22 at this point. Okay. So, a yeah. child. Yeah. The three men would take off from the crime scene. I just said, I called him a child and I said men. <laughs> and they would not be tracked down for nearly five days after this. Oh. God, this poor officer's just in the parking lot. During their trials, David and Jeffrey both pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and received life sentences without the possibility of parole to avoid the death penalty. Sean, who cooperated with authorities from the start and didn't physically harm Kevin, was sentenced to five years in prison plus five years of supervised release for, of course, association and then stealing the firearms. So David and the other guy, sorry, what was his name? Jeffrey. Jeff. Oh, oh, the cousin. Duh. Yes. Um, but they both shot Kevin, yes. the officer. Okay. David shot him first, and then Kevin shot him last. I see, I see, okay. David would be sent to Clinton Correctional Facility in Danamora, Clinton County. Dun, dun, dun. As I'm sure you can tell by now, Richard and David would become homies while in prison together. Best friends. Be put in adjoining cells. And although David had never escaped in the past, Richard surely had, and this time, he was looking for a partner in crime. Da, da, da. <laughs> Sorry if you're wearing pop, headphones. Pop, pop. Just to be clear, this is Richard from the very beginning and David. They are now in adjoining cells in the same prison. Yes. The two served their time. Would quickly get married. Yes, the two would quickly, quickly get, get married. married. <laughs> no, that's funny. Quickly get married. Well, you'll see. LOL. The two served their time on the quote honor block, which was housing gained for good behavior that allows for greater movement, the right to cook meals for yourself. And even the benefit of wearing street clothes while in your cell. This is death row? This is life. Or, sorry, life, not death row. Yeah. So, you, they're just, like, living in, like, they, yeah. there's, like, an apartment. Yeah. And I'm it's sorry, like good dorm. behavior? Yeah. You murdered a fucking cop and you're on, you're here? Like, what? Another benefit of this block was bigger cells given to those inmates who had no infractions on their record for numerous years at a time. Richard got to prison in, what, 2008? 
Yeah. And then now David in 2002, which is funny because he's <laughs> before him. But this is now 2015. So they've been, both been in good behavior, like nothing on their record for a while. Yeah. So we're going to jump forward, like I said, to June 6th, 2015. Guards were doing their usual 5.30 a.m. rounds when they noticed that Richard, Matt, and David Sweat were not waking up, despite numerous attempts at alerting them for rounds. Ugh, it's like a Shawshank moment. <laughs> Upon entering the cells, guards realized the true nature of what had happened to the two inmates. They were gone. Gonzo. what you say there, fuzzy britches? <laughs> Literally a Shawshank moment. <laughs> Ugh. The only thing left behind in their cell was a note that read, quote, have a nice day with a smiley face. Have a nice day. Yeah. Who said that? Somebody did that. Somebody else did have a nice day. Have a nice day. I don't know. That was somebody else that, that had written that before. A killer. Don't know. The smiley face killer. The smiley face, probably. <laughs> it was quickly realized that the two had not been accounted for since 1030 the night before. 1030 That's p.m. That's a long time. During the last count of the night. Yeah. So seven fucking hours. Again, it's like when that shot where they're searching for Andy and they get all the way to like the river or the sewer, whatever line. And then he's, and Red starts narrating again. And he's like, and about that time, a man that had never been seen in this area before or whatever walks into a bank. And it's just like, because, <gasps> you know, he's already like, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's okay. It, it's funny. Cause it's really it's exciting. Eerily similar. Really? It was immediately reported that a quote, external breach was found on a street approximately 500 feet outside the prison walls, indicating that the inmates had successfully tunneled out of the prison and escaped. Oh shit. It was literally like Shawshank. Wow. Upon further inspection, guards noted that there was no way the two could have created the tunnel they used to escape from any tools kept inside of the prison, and instead, they would actually have had to use power tools to do what they did. What? As details of this escape got more specific, it seemed as though Richard and David had used power tools that they had stolen from contractors that were working at the prison okay. and somehow returned them back to their rightful place before the end of the workday. <gasps> this is a good theory, but kind of like how. Yeah. They can't get out of their cells on their own. Well, you said that they were in that really lax environment, though. Yes. Yeah, so although this seemed like a good theory, it was not all that had happened that allowed the men to escape. Hmm. In reality, the two were being given very special treatment by two of the employees of the prison for months before the escape. Okay. One guard, Jean Palmer, was noted on multiple occasions as giving the men tools and special clearance to certain parts of the prison. Jean had been on the force for 27 years before he began giving the inmates certain tools. He would give them, like, a screwdriver or, like, pliers. Like, mm. not anything you could use to do this, but still, things that they weren't allowed to have. Yeah. What was the cover-up then? Like, saying, like, I'm going to whittle some wood, or I'm oh, going to... I'll hmm. tell you. Uh, actually, it wasn't really a cover-up. It was kind of like an exchange for stuff. Okay. So Gene was noted as giving the two men a flathead screwdriver and needle-nose pliers on four occasions between November 2014 and the day of the escape, June 6, 2015. So between that time frame, like a couple of fucking months, like eight months, Yeah. he gave them tools on four separate occasions. But that wouldn't... How could somebody tunnel all the way through there just on four separate occasions? Just so. wait. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like getting, it's I'm okay. just getting like, oh. His explanation of the tool giving was that he would exchange tools to Richard Matt for hand-painted canvases of Richard's. Oh. Richard was really good at painting. Hmm. He, I don't know if he was trying to sell the paintings or he just really liked the paintings because Richard was known to do paintings of like celebrities and stuff. Oh. He would later state about this, quote, Matt provided me with elaborate paintings and information on the legal acts that inmates were committing within the facility. So you know? he used his informant stuff before. Yeah. In turn, I provided him with benefits such as paint, paintbrushes, movement of inmates, hamburger meat, altering of electrical boxes in the catwalk areas. I did not realize at the time that the assistance provided to Matt or Sweat made their escape easier. Mm. End quote. He also stated that the electrical work he mentioned was done, quote, to enhance their ability to cook in their cells. So he thinks he's doing these men a favor because yeah. they're nice and they're exchanging information. Right. Besides and it's the for tools, the greater good kind of aspect. It's for everybody's benefit. Exactly. Yeah. Besides, like, the screwdriver and the pliers, like, everything else is pretty innocent, right? Yeah. Giving them food, giving them paint, you know, yeah. stuff like that. Making it a little bit easier for them to cook. Mm -hmm. So you're probably wondering about the hamburger meat. <laughs> I mean, I guess, because obviously it's to cook. Mm -hmm. The worst assistant to this crime was one Joyce Mitchell, who worked in the prison tailor shop. So she okay. wasn't a guard, but she was an employee. Mm -hmm. 
Instead of just placing the meat into a, quote, green-colored woven cloth bag, Joyce also included multiple hacksaw blades, a screwdriver bit, and various other tools. Why? She then put the bag into the freezer and directed Jean Palmer to deliver it to the men. The re- I'll get into that in a second. <laughs> the reason Jean did not question the secrecy of the delivery was because delivering prisoners' food in general was considered contraband, mm-hmm. and although he was not cool with bringing in the power tools, he was okay with providing the food. Yeah. So he didn't question, he didn't look through the bag, he didn't question it, he just gave it to them, right? Yeah. I wonder if maybe around that time he had been kind of, like, being weary about giving them tools, and yeah. maybe that's why they were like, well, he might not argue with food, you know? Exactly. Hmm. So Richard and David were able to use these power tools provided by Joyce and unknowingly Jean to cut through pipes and make their way through a series of catwalks and walls to make it through to the outside. Again, this was months, like eight months that this was happening. At least. Here, they would emerge from a manhole and escape into the darkness. It is Shawshank. That's crazy. Authorities would later discover that the two inmates were supposed to be picked up after their escape by one... Joyce, Joyce Mitchell. Ah, oh, you dummy. But you dummy Joyce. She would not arrive to their aid that morning. Oh. In fact, at the same time that the men were escaping, Joyce was experiencing severe chest pains and admitted herself to the hospital. Guilty conscience, perhaps? Yeah, I was thinking. I was like, <laughs> she gave herself a fucking heart attack with all that worry. Yep. Since Joyce was not there to pick up the men like she'd promised, they were forced to get far away on foot. Unfortunately, they had a little while to do so since they were, they had seven hours essentially from the yeah. escape to when they did the count at five. So who knows how far they could have gotten. Yeah. Richard and David were able to be undetected for three days until police received a tip that the two had been spotted around the town of Willsboro, New York on June 9th. Police spent the days of June 9th and 10th searching around the area even extending their search to the border of Vermont in case the two tried to flee the state. Law enforcement in Canada and Mexico were also given information on the men in case they tried to leave the country. Within the next couple of days, the FBI, CBP, which is Customs and Border Protection, RCMP, which is Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the ATF, which is the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosive, (laughs) state and local police the New York State Forest Rangers, and the U.S. Marshal Service were all involved in this search. Jesus. I mean, obviously. Yeah. They're two murderers. I mean... Yeah. A $50,000 bounty was set for each inmate originally, but was actually increased to 75000 each when the U.S. Marshals took it upon themselves to add twenty five k to each man. Where do you go? Like, where do you, where do you think you're going to go? Seriously. Especially, like, when you don't have a ride in them. Definitely if they had a car. <laughs> Fucking Joyce. Fucking Joyce. Just <laughs> ruining everything, Joyce. <laughs> But, you know, if they had a car, they probably would be a lot further, a lot faster. Yeah. But at the same time, where are you going to go? Like, yeah. you're internationally going to be looked for. Where do you think? Yeah, exactly. Honestly. So from the day of the escape, June 6th to June 11th, there were two sightings of the men, but no reported break-ins, robberies, homicides, etc. No crime around the area. Which is smart on their part, because exactly. they're only going to, I mean, they're going to leave a trail, yeah. uh, essentially, you know, if they try to rob anybody of a car or money or yeah, whatever. Yeah, Exactly. On June 11th, law enforcement closed a stretch of New York State Route 374, school classes were canceled in Danamora and nearby Saranac, and officers present in the area were increased from 300 to more than 500 total, just in that area around the prison. That's gotta be really scary, though, like... Schools were closed? I have a friend of mine, her mom lives behind, uh, like, the, not Bear County Jail, but, like, behind a jail, and I always worry about that. I'm like, you know, I mean, the property taxes are cheap. Well, yeah, (laughs) when I used to live in San Marcos, when I would travel up to Kyle for Mm -hmm. work, it's, like, 20 minutes, but in between San Marcos and Kyle, there's a jail, like a... Yeah. It's, it's like, a actually a big security unit. It's right off the highway, and there's a bunch of razor wire and stuff, Mm -hmm. and it says, like, do not pick up hitchhikers. I'm like, ugh! (laughs) I know. So, on June 11th, later that afternoon... Bloodhounds were able to pick up a scent, and authorities were able to discover a footprint as well. From here, the police began searching methodically in a wooded area near where the scent was picked up. This was in a nearby town called Caddyville. Although this was not a lead that produced definite evidence that the two men were there, it was the only thing they had at the Mm -hmm. moment. Nothing really came of this search, although police did put up billboards in the area, hoping that somebody would spot the men if they hadn't gotten far. These billboards would quickly stretch to New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Vermont, Pennsylvania, and all along the U.S.-Canada border. (laughs) Wow. I know. 
Seven days after the escape, on June 12th, police would arrest Joyce Mitchell with aiding to the escapes. Good. She cracked. <laughs> after, like, yeah. Say crack again. <laughs> crack. Crack. <laughs> well, you'd think that... It's not like she was hard to find, right? She's probably, like, on a fucking pacemaker now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> During the week since the escape, police were making connections to not only Joyce Miss- Mitchell, but Jean Palmer as well. It had come out in many different speculations that Joyce was actually sleeping with David Sweat and Richard <gasps> Matt, or at least had on one occasion, but this was never confirmed by Joyce. Or at least t- tempted to, or there was clearly like a f- flirtation there. What was confirmed, however, was that Joyce prov- provided nude photos of herself to both men. <laughs> Stating, quote, I was caught up in the fantasy. I enjoyed the attention, the feeling both of them gave me, and the thought of a different life. She's fucking married, by the way. And to them, they're probably like, this okay. This is nasty. <laughs> yeah, this bitch is this how nasty. But she's going to help us escape. Exactly. Yeah. We so can, we can manipulate we her. We can manipulate her. Once Joy started confessing to her involvement, things became much more clear. Sometime around January of 2015, so five months before the escape, Richard and David began devising their plan and approached Joyce for help. After smuggling in the tools for the men to use, Joyce was to meet them outside on the night of the escape with a car filled with guns, ammo, camping gear, and a compass. Gotta go to the fireworks stand. Yeah. Go get all the right stuff. (laughs) The men convinced Joyce that they would include her in their long-term escape plans and even kill her husband in order to give her a chance to be with them instead. Yeah. I'm shook. Yeah. I'm shook. They were going to have, like, this poly three-way relationship of some kind. I don't know, but yeah. I mean, I'm sure she wanted that. I I guarantee you they would have just used her until they got what they needed. They probably would have killed her, too, honestly, if she knew everything. Exactly. However, as we know, Joyce did not show up outside the prison for the men the night of their escape, and instead checked herself into the hospital due to chest pains. It turns out she just had hella anxiety because everything came to the surface and she couldn't handle the fucking pressure. Aw, I remember my first panic attack. for real. (laughs) Call the police. Call 911. Seriously, I thought I was having a literal heart attack. Same. After being arrested, Joyce would be charged with, quote, providing material assistance to Richard and David. (laughs) Jean Palmer had not yet been looked at as a suspect, but of course they were going through, like, the whole employee roster. Yeah. Why does this Jean guy in my head look like Tim from the bar? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he actually might you think look. so i think he looks like tim from the bar this poor man <laughs> he, he doesn't but he, I mean, he, he kind of does he kind of does he <laughs> resembles him slightly <laughs> that's, that's who i funny. think of though that's what um joyce looks like in female form <laughs> what does joyce look like tim. i want to know what joyce looks like it's gonna be rough isn't it she's bad it's probably gonna be a little rough <laughs> is it a little rough Oh, Jesus. She looks like a woman that would try to sleep with two prisoners. I'm sorry. That's awful. Oh, she has a snaggle lower tooth. How does that even happen? (laughs) Snaggle lower tooth. Okay, so. On June 13th, helicopters, all-terrain vehicles, and search dogs were added to the search. Again, they escaped on the 6th. I'm just saying. Well, okay, so at this point, do you think that Joyce knows anything about a potential escape plan or any of that other, you know what I mean? Or you think she's keeping all that shit to herself? Well, no, she does. She knows. Okay. Because remember, she was supposed to meet them outside with guns and all that shit. No, of course. But I'm just saying, like, do you think that they also talked about thoroughly about them ending up in a specific area or what, you know what I mean? Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, yeah, I'll get there in a second. Okay. Unfortunately, the weather was particularly bad this day and it stunted the growth of the search party and actually put it on hold for a few days. But so wouldn't that, that wasn't good. That's not wouldn't good. that also stunt them, though? Especially if they're out True. there in the wild. On June 20th, a fortnight after the men escaped. A fortnight. Two weeks, to be exact. <laughs> the search would continue in Algany County, western New York, after police received a tip that the men had been seen in Friendship, New York. Friendship! That's cute. Friendship! <laughs> Two days later, June 22nd, police received a tip that a cabin near the prison had been broken into, and they had a feeling it had something to do with the men. Which is hilarious. It's been 16 days and you're still near the fucking prison. Like, where are you going to (laughs) go? But that's the thing is, like, everybody's looking for you. So the moment you step outside, someone's going to see you. Exactly. When police were searching the cabin, they weren't there. They found two pairs of prison-issued underwear. 
And not that it was necessary, but they were able to test the DNA and they both came back as matches for Richard and David. <laughs> Just left behind their fucking underwear. Okay, so they're not wearing their underwear. He's naked somewhere. Yeah. And <laughs> he's naked somewhere. He's naked somewhere. Well, he has a huge dick. Just he's got a dick. huge dick. <laughs> looking for a guy with a huge dick. Seriously. <laughs> Swing it in the wind. Yeah. So then they definitely uh, left some pubes behind. Oh, for sure. Found all that. Okay. Because of this discovery, investigators concluded that the two had been there within the previous 24 hours. <laughs> the pubes were fresh. I'll tell you why in a second. Ew. Meanwhile, prison guards were actually reported to have been beating other inmates in order to try to get information out of them on the whereabouts of the men or oh, what their plan was. Shit. I know. It's That's awful. That's fucked up. Are you ready? Why aren't they beating the shit out of Joyce? <laughs> Where is he? Breaker snaggle dude. Breaker snag. The police were able to gather quite a bit of information from the cabin search, however. And they were able to deduce that Richard had most likely gotten sick from consuming spoiled food or dirty water because the underwear they found had <laughs> shat in them. <laughs> had shat in them. He pooped his pants. Tense. Had shat in them. <laughs> I don't know if he pooped his pants, but there was shat in the underwear. So. That's where they were getting <laughs> they were the like DNA from. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's uh, awful. Well, what they were essentially saying was like, clearly these guys aren't really like going out of their way to get like food or water, right? Because they're, like he's sick. <laughs> they're essentially making themselves sick just based off of what they're trying to survive off of. Yeah. So exactly. okay. Even so, the duo were able to evade police for another few days. Wow. On June 26th, 20 days after the breakout. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just thinking, why don't they just follow the scent of shit? <laughs> follow the shit trail. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole new definition of the term shit stain. Yeah. <laughs> On June 26th, 20 days after the breakout, Richard Matt was spotted in Franklin County, New York, after he shot the driver of a passing vehicle with a <gasps> shotgun. Oh, shit. He was trying to kill the driver and steal the vehicle, but he was unsuccessful, and the man would survive and get away. Oh, good. No. It's like, you can't... Okay, so he made it, what, 22 days, 24 days without harming anyone? Harming anybody. But now they're getting desperate. They're probably really hungry. They're probably yeah. dehydrated. They're probably... Yeah. They're running around without underwear. <laughs> like, they're naked. They're naked somewhere. <laughs> Shit on his ass cheeks. <laughs> just running through the street. Haul, just hauling ass with shit. <laughs> the driver was able to alert police. <laughs> he sits down in someone's car and shit in the fucking seat. <laughs> the perp was here. <laughs> <laughs> he can't sit anywhere else he's gonna get found out. <laughs> the feet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's really funny. I knew you'd like that. So the driver was able to alert police, and U.S. Border Patrol officers were sent to investigate. After searching for a while, they heard something familiar. <laughs> the sound of a pussy-ass bitch coughing <laughs> around the corner. <laughs> <coughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> I swear to God. What? They heard him cough. They heard he was, him cough? He was trying to, like, hide from them, and he coughed. That sounds like a joke, like one of those, uh, like, the potato sack joke. It's like, meow. Oh, it's just a cat. Woof, woof. Oh, it's just a dog. When they were hiding in the oh, potatoes. Oh, yeah. Sack. It's like, potatoes. potatoes. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Idiot. No, yeah. Like, he literally, like, he, like, couldn't hold in a cough, and that's how they found him. I thought you were going to say you couldn't hold in a, a fart or a something. Fart. <laughs> that would be even funnier. Like, oh, there he is. <laughs> I can smell him from here. They came across Richard Matt carrying the shotgun still. Police urged him to drop the weapon, but when he refused and held it up, Richard Matt was shot by a supervisory agent and former army ranger Chris Voss. Richard would be shot three times in the head <gasps> and would not survive his wounds. Wow. So he died right there. He died. Richard's body would not be claimed for over a week after his capture, and the prison would release a statement that they would be putting Richard through a pauper's funeral if his body was not claimed by 5 p.m. that day. Okay. I... Didn't know what that was. So essentially it would be like an un like a John Doe type it's what, situation. Well, it's what prisoners or the prison would do if an inmate died and then no one claimed their body. Yes. The same thing. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Nicholas Harris, Richard's son, would be the one to step up and claim his father's body. <gasps> wow. Nicholas was 23 at this time and it was not the least bit surprised that his father was able to escape once again. Yeah. Nicholas was noted as saying that it was, quote, shocking that nobody would really expect that. Like, he fucking escaped before. He tried to escape in Mexico. Yeah. Like, 
He's not. You had to put snipers outside of the fucking courtroom when you arrested him. Like, right. You really didn't think he was going to try to escape. And you give him all this freedom in prison. Not that it's their fault, but still. Yeah. Sounds like Nicholas just. He's like, you guys are fucking idiots. Like, I, I know Give I'm better me than you. I've guy. never even fucking met the guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm never, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nicholas would also refer to his father as a, quote, genius, but told sources, quote, I don't know him to say I respect him or not. Because I guess they asked him if he respected him. him. Yeah. I don't know him. I don't know him. How could I? David's location was unknown at the time of Richard's death, as the two had split up. After Richard took off, David hid in a deer blind used by hunters and even saw an officer walk right past him as he hid. (sighs) Two days later, on June 28th, New York State Trooper Sergeant Jay Cook drove past David as he was walking down the road. Just casually, probably (laughs) naked. (laughs) Probably naked. He's freeballing it, at least. (laughs) Underwear. Jay immediately circled back to have a chat with him, unsure right away if it was actually David or not. Yeah. I'm sure he was. But again, remember, they had street clothes. Yeah, that's true. I mean, they could have just just been in his street clothes. Hey, by the way, just, you're walking out here by yourself. We're on the lookout for somebody. Yeah. That actually looks a lot like you. So, if if you see your doppelganger, just give us a call. Can I see your, can you take your pants off and see your underwear? (laughs) (laughs) Are you shitting yourself right now? (laughs) That was Richard. Oh, my bad. Once the officer turned around, David began running across a hayfield, and Jay would begin chasing him. Oh, shit. The officer shot twice at David, hitting him in his right shoulder and left arm from 73 yards away. Dang. Good shot. (laughs) This incident occurred about 16 miles from where Richard was found, and just a mile and a half from the Canadian border. Oh, so he was, like, almost there. Clearly. Or seemingly, I guess. Mm. David would be taken to Albany Medical Center, where he was in critical condition, but he would ultimately survive. Critical condition from being shot? Well, I guess arteries. You have arteries yeah. all throughout there. That makes sense. I'm sure they didn't, like, race him to the hospital either. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine. Get up. <laughs> Come on. Come on. You can walk. <laughs> on July 5th, 2015, David was moved to a special ho- special housing unit in the Maximum Security Five Points Correctional Facility. David would plead guilty to two felony accounts of first-degree escape, which I didn't know that was a thing, and an additional count of promoting prison contraband. He was sentenced to three and a half to seven years to be served consecutively with his life sentence. Wow. He would later admit that the two split up because Richard became, quote, unfocused and was, quote, slowing him down. He was just slowing me down. But he's, he's probably going one. fucking it was crazy. his idea. Hallucinating because yeah. he's probably hungry as shit. He's starving. Joyce Mitchell pleaded guilty to promoting prison contraband Mm. and criminal facilitation. She was sentenced to two and one third to seven years in prison. Two and one third. Two and a third third. of a year to seven years. It was like a thing. Yeah. She was granted parole and released from prison in February of 2020. Wow. Jean Palmer pleaded guilty to promoting prison contraband, which is a felony, and was sentenced to six months in jail. He would serve four months and be released on good behavior. There are tons of stories on this, and the most popular one is probably Showtime's Escape at Dan- uh, Danamora. That's, like, the biggest one. She should have been charged for the crimes that they committed after they escaped. She also should have been charged for, like, indecent exposure with an inmate. Because even though that wasn't... they can't consent. Yeah, they can't yeah. consent. And even though they might not have had sex, she still gave them nude photos of herself. Yeah. She probably got a hell of a plea deal, though, because she probably she gave probably them did. all the info she knew about them. Yeah. Not to say that it assisted in their capture. But even them shooting that guy with a shotgun, yeah. she should be liable she for that. She should, for sure. She's taking, take her ass to civil court. From fucking hacksaw. Like, come on. But yeah, it was like a Shawshank fucking moment, and I just want to pepper this in here at the end. No diagnosis was ever, like, done for Richard Matt. I don't know if he was ever evaluated. I saw one source that said that David Sweat was either diagnosed or suspected of antisocial personality mm. disorder. But yeah, <laughs> that that's a hell of a case. Little... Well, I'm glad that Andy Dufresne got away, but I'm certainly glad these guys didn't. I mean, yeah, it's fucking nuts. Like, and I was like, dude, I, I heard briefly, like on another podcast, they mentioned the documentary and I was like, I have to do that case. Like, that sounds interesting. so interesting. I was yeah. like, how cool would it be to like see both of their childhoods and then right. when they met up and, you know, Richard was, I don't want to say significantly older than Dave. He's 15 years older than him. Yeah, you know, or, it's not too bad. Yeah. And, but still like. Clearly, I mean, charming, manipulative, not only with women, but I'm sure it led into this situation relationship with David in prison because he was older, more experienced as a criminal. And David probably thought that 
Richard was so cool, like, and, and he was cooler by proxy because he knew this, like, career criminal. And he's and, escaped like, before, so why wouldn't I trust him to yeah. use that to escape? And shit, he fucking did it. I mean, they did it. Yeah. But yeah, that's, uh... Interesting. Wow. I know. It was, uh... What a doozy. doozy. So, it wasn't until, and I was gonna ask earlier, but, like, did they find them in a cabin? Because I remember that when you were saying 2015, I was like, I, there's no way I haven't heard of this. Yeah. And I did remember it after you were talking about, but I wouldn't have remembered names or known anything about the past, um, you know, their past at all. Yeah, it's really unfortunate because, I mean, both of them really just got kind of put through the ringer, like, immediately when they were born. Yeah. Like, they didn't really have a fucking chance, like, neither one of them. Yeah. With they... Richard being left in the car, and then, you know, thank thankfully, Nicholas didn't get subjected to all that because, sure. because Richard was in jail when he was born. Good for you, Nicholas, for breaking the cycle of abuse. Yeah, Good absolutely. I completely agree. And then, of course, with David, like, you know, his mom, like, admitted to not having given him the best childhood, but then, like, just shipped him off to foster care to be with his aunt and uncle when he yeah. when he wasn't, you know, responding the way she wanted to. It's like, what the fuck do you expect? Like, yeah. you're partying all the time. Like, I'm sure the household wasn't calm, you know, ever. Yeah. And, you know, perhaps there was, you know, verbal abuse, psychological abuse, whatever. And then you expect him to just be like an angel child. Like, right. You know, not everybody, especially if he has antisocial personality disorder, that can be caused by trauma and not caused, but brought to the forefront. If right. If it's, you know, genetically um, predisposed. You yeah. Know? It seemed like neither of them were close to their fathers, really. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, the exposure that I think Richard had, he was like an asshole. He was a criminal, too. And a criminal. Um, and then both, again, foster care and all that other stuff, and then, you know, it's just, yeah. Yeah, but that was a... Formidable years right there that hadn't, hadn't been taken care of. Yeah, there was a bunch, a bunch of additional information that I felt just, it wouldn't have made the story any more clear. It was a lot of other information I found, though, so definitely recommend if you want to hear, like, more of, like, all the details, watch the document, the, um, Escape at Dannemore, I think is Showtime, but there's a bunch of other ones and what was it? I know Shawshank, it's like kind of, it's not based on obviously because it happened before, but people compare it a lot to Shawshank. And if you mm -hmm. haven't seen that movie, it's really good. It's really good. And the best other... part is when the uh, guard says, if I hear so much as a mouse fart in here, I'm coming in here and cracking skulls or whatever the fuck he says. <laughs> like, it's so good. <laughs> yeah. And um, there was like, I think there was like a Dateline or some kind of episode like that, like something on Oxygen about it. Sure. And then there's like a couple different, like just single episodes out. You can find it on online. I'm sure there, that it's from. I'm sure there was quite a bit of coverage just because I mean it was 2015. It's not like it's yeah, you know for the 1930s. Sure. And I left this out as well, like in my notes, but I did just want to also mention like David's mom when she found out that he escaped, like. She said that he had stopped writing letters to her, like, two months before they escaped. Like, they had, like, frequently written letters, and he stopped. And then she was saying, like, when he escaped, we were, like, so fearful that he was going to get killed or he was going to hurt somebody yeah. else. And she's like, I'm really thankful that he's alive, but I'm not interested in talking to him. Well, it sounds like if if he stopped corresponding with her, it sounds like he did it kind of out of protect her, not to give him a great quality, yeah. you know, but to kind of, because they would probably think, the first place I'm going to go is to my mom's because I'm really close to my mom. Yeah, no, for sure. And it, it probably came from a good place if you want to give him mm -hmm. that, but I don't know. So yeah, there's not really much known about like David today, but if, of course he's in like a <laughs> maximum security, like cannot get out, like probably like t one hour a day outside yeah. in a cage. And he is like 43, I think yeah. now. So yeah. Yeah. Well, that's well within my age range. I guess I'm going to write him on a little letter. Oh my gosh, don't be one of those girls. Like, right? Hey, can you tell me how you were scammed? What was there? We talked about that, hint, hint, something similar to that yeah. on the bonus episode of Lady that I did. It mm -hmm. hasn't come out yet, but... That'd be an interesting mental breakdown. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you guys for joining us. Really fun. I like Yet that again. one. It was different. Ugh, thankfully, I don't have to deal with that anymore. I just feel so bad for Nicholas, but he, by all accounts, has just seemed so graceful about like the whole thing like super like i'm not associated with my father but you guys are dumb for not realizing who he is it, like i love that like thought process it's like i don't even fucking know him and i know him more than you like i yeah. know him better than you because you guys don't fucking pay attention you right know? yeah do well, better just... and i know that they did at that prison they like cemented down that sewer like the manhole and then they like they like took additional measures to make it more secure yeah you know from now on and That's of good. course those people don't work there anymore so it's crazy Okay, well, we will be back soon with yep. another Minty Breaky. Get some Minty merch. On Monday. Get some merch. Diagnosingakiller.com. Check us out on social media. Everywhere is at Diagnosing a Killer, other than Twitter, which is at Killer Diagnosis. 
I'm getting better at that. Yeah, write us a review. Leave us a review. I looked on Spotify last night, the analytics, and we have like 300 followers on Spotify. Really? Yeah. It says oh, we have 80 on Apple, but we have like 300 on Spotify. So thank you. And I also noticed the only state in America that we haven't had a download in is South Dakota. So if anyone knows anyone from South Dakota, refer our podcast that to them. That is so funny. What were we... I, I think it was... I want to say it was Jordan and Saxon that they said, like, one of the places that they haven't met anybody from in their lives is South Dakota. Do you think South Dakota exists? No, it's probably, like, a Montana. It's, like, a Montana thing. It doesn't yeah. exist. Yeah. yeah. Or birds. Well, birds aren't real. Same thing with, like, bears. Like, apparently the only bear that exists is, like, cocaine bear. Oh, yeah. You know, Alex has sure that uh, Dana got it for Alex and said if it flies, it spies. <laughs> it's like they always <laughs> joke flies. about, like, birds aren't real. It flies. <laughs> it flies. It spies. It's and then... A news report the other day about how they were taking like dead birds and then they were like reanimating them with computers inside their heads. Hell no! I know. No, it's actually, like, make that happen. <laughs> it's, it's, it's happening. <laughs> yeah, but South Dakota. If anyone knows anybody in South Dakota, hit us up. Hit us up. And also, we got a download in Iceland. <gasps> I know. It's Bjork. Is it? I don't know. <laughs> I like, Is it? I don't know. I hope so. Yeah, Iceland and Bermuda. <gasps> we got a download in Bermuda, or maybe a couple. Wow. But we're, like, super poppin' in the UK. Like, we love you guys. Oh, I love that. Please, please message us if you're from another country. I say that, like, every Kenan episode. really wants to just communicate with somebody from another country. I, have I think always, it's interesting, like, the cultural differences. I've always been super interested in the idea of, like, a pen pal from yeah. another country. Like, I really have. And mm. that's why I'm, like, so excited, because this is a real way to connect with people yeah. across the fucking world. I was, so, uh, hit us up. talking to a friend of mine who lives in Manchester, and, uh, uh, we were just doing like little voice messages back and forth and he said he was he was like oh i just got off of work i'm waiting for the lift like i'm waiting for my lift and, da, 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 da. and i was like there? i was like they have lift and then i was like oh an elevator oh i, <laughs> I was, was like, still thinking well because i was like well it's i hear dinging in the background and i was like it doesn't sound like he's outside it's you like, know why don't it's you just take an uber it's better <laughs> yeah and i was like oh that's cool. like i didn't realize they had ubers or lifts or Oh, you mean a fucking elevator. That's well, adorable. Well, I might sound silly, but wasn't Uber, like, an... Is it an American company? I thought it was invented in it's Germany. It's only in America, yeah. No. Well, it's, an, it's a German word. It's a German word, yeah. I, I really... They don't have the umlaut on top of it, though, I don't think. Oh, I don't know. I thought it was available worldwide. No. I might be wrong. Well, because it puts other rideshare companies out of business. Like, there's yeah. some... I mean, it's like those scooter... Stupid yeah, scooter things. Yeah, the bird scooters. God, the I lime fucking scooters. hated those. What a terrible fucking idea. I almost got hit by a car on one of those in Oklahoma. Yeah, because <laughs> nobody's fucking looking out for them. They're not... They're not really, like, even street legal. They're You're not. supposed to ride them on the sidewalk they where go people like, walk. I think they go up to, like, seven or eight miles an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fucking fast. Drunk people take them home. They constantly crash into cars. Like, on one of those it's just ridiculous. And, th and then it's just like, they're wasteful because apparently they make them really, really cheap. So, like, unless people are, like, picking them up to, like, do the battery mm -hmm. charging station or whatever, like, they'll just... I mean, it's just wasteful. It's just literally just trash on the ground. You created trash. Thanks. <laughs> you created trash. <laughs> I mean, and you are is. trash. And you're trash. And you should feel trashy for making trash. Oh, man. But yeah, like in places like, uh, like even in New York and stuff, they wanted to ban Ubers and Lyfts because it was putting the city's taxi business out of business. Oh, yeah, like we don't like, even have taxis anymore. Yeah, we really don't. It I takes mean, like 40 minutes. I have only ever ridden in a taxi twice, once in Hawaii and once in Austin. Yeah, and that's I've it. only ever ridden in a taxi once. Oh, in New York. And we I did was, New York. Me and Kelly were catching a, a taxi to go to a party at like 15, 16 years old. That was and when taxis like, like were Oh, it cost us like 30 fucking bucks. <laughs> it was down the street. I don't think it was 30 bucks, but... I remember one time I was with my friends and we tried to prank... We were just doing like prank calls or whatever, like before... Like when cell phones like first became a thing and I dialed two 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 two. I was like, no one's gonna have this number. Ha! They opened like yellow cab and I was like, oh, fuck, shit. <laughs> I was like, damn it. They got me. We used to call information. We'd be like, yeah, could you get me the number to Travis Barker in Riverside, California? <laughs> oh, that's so funny. They were like, sure thing. <laughs> one second. That's awesome. Well, yeah, thank you guys for joining us. If any other podcasts are listening and you guys want to potentially hit us up, we yeah, can check out your podcast. We'd like to connect with others, you know, how it goes. Too. I'm really excited to get to know some people at the True Crime Paranormal Podcast Festival in Austin in August. Again, I'm you can so take it for that at diagnosingakiller.com, and uh, there should be a link on there. Again, click all the links, guys. Click all the links. Click all the links. Yeah. And also, I just wanted to plug this really quick. I know we have, like, a specific ad for it, but we are now sponsored by BetterHelp as well. If you guys 
are interested in starting any kind of therapy or looking for someone new or something 100% virtual, we are sponsored by BetterHelp. You can go to betterhelp.com slash D-A-K-P-O-D for 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, just to be clear. And yeah, they are sponsoring us now, and we obviously care a lot about you guys and your mental health, so we definitely sure. want to make that available to you guys as well. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we should put that on the website, too. Yeah. Since yeah, it's a right. like, web link instead of For like sure. just a code. It'll be on the uh, resource tab. Cool. We'll put it on there. Okay, well, we will see you guys next time. All right, Bye. love you. Bye. Bye. You don't need real ink to make an impact. Let the power of temporary tattoos tell your story. Temporary Tattoos specializes in a wide range of temporary body art, including custom tattoos, with the option to add unique effects like metallic, glitter, glow-in-the-dark, and so much more. Temporary tattoos are easy to apply and last up to five days. When you're ready for your new look, simply remove your fake tattoo using their lemon-scented removing wipes, rinse, and repeat. Temporary Tattoo, experiment with a new look without the commitment. Use the link in the show notes below for 10% off stock tattoos and bring your new look to life. Are you a true crime advocate? Are you passionate about uncovering the truth and bringing justice to victims? Do you love the paranormal and spooky tales? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then you won't want to miss the True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival in Austin, Texas, this August from the 25th to the 27th. This festival features panel discussions, workshops, and live podcasts focusing on ethics and advocacy in the true crime sphere. Get your tickets now at truecrimepodcastfestival.com and join us in Austin for an unforgettable experience.